there's so many things to key into here. My hot peppers, I was just out yesterday giving my first talk ever on hot peppers to a class on sustainable agriculture out at the O'Donohue Garden. And believe me, to have me growing my peppers with the aid of fantastic agricultural experts who are out there, it's what allows me to go away for three months in the summer, just walk out on my peppers to go do the work I'm going to be talking to you about. Um, there's something very Stanford-esque about that. I can't, can't put my finger on it. It's privilege. It's, it's something when you need it. And you know, rather than trust a drip system in my backyard of highly shadowed peppers, I've got this big sky country. Oh my god, wonderful. At any rate, um, I'm also pleased to hear you're going to be going to listen to an authority after my talk. And I hope I can give you some perspectives, not so much on our president, who seems to have a very reasonable way of managing authority um, at, of the university. That's the last one of those I will do. I'll try to promise you. But this is a subject matter I've been talking about long before things like that. Um, and so I'm very stuck on the idea of authority and what it means to us. I think it means a whole lot more than most of us realize. We are creatures of authoritarian systems. I don't care what government you live under. If it's a state, it's authoritarian. That's why it's a state. But I'm getting ahead of myself. It sounds like I'm going to give a talk on modern politics, and I'm not. I'm giving you a talk on my site in high altitude Peru in this environment of image modified and otherwise ripped off from Google, um, where you can see the town of Chavin, that light blip in the lower right-hand side, a little bit right of center, and the site immediately adjacent to it, that, white, that whitish blip um, there is the town of Chavin. The site is just to the left of it, that tan patch. Um, and it is a monumental site. It's a World Heritage Site. Um, one of, I think, five that Peru has. It was second after Machu Picchu to be recognized by UNESCO as having universal human values. Okay. And that was before my time, 1985, um, my, before my time in Chavin. I was busy digging caves at that moment and dreaming of Chavin, I have to confess, being a bit of a traitor to my high-altitude hunter-gatherer cave sites. And through very many twists and turns, I came to work in Chavin and passed this quarter of a century there. And I want to try to give you an idea of the output of that to me. Some of the finds, the specific things, sure. But what does it mean? Why do you spend 25 years at 11,000 feet? That's kind of low for the Andes. What are you pursuing? And I'm trying to pursue us. I'm trying to understand how we got to where we are. Well, again, let's start kind of at the beginning. Most of you can recognize this individual, Hugo Chavez, who started things going in a very different direction in Venezuela, um, in some senses towards where they are now. But my point with really in showing his image, Hugo Chavez was a strong man. You can argue he was elected democratically. You can argue a lot of things. But you didn't argue with Hugo Chavez, I'll tell you that much. You didn't find yourself in one piece for very long if you did. Um, and I'm not criticizing that. A lot of people are talking about the limitations of democracy these days. Um, he, in some ways, demonstrated that amply. But he also demonstrated the limitations of departing from democracy, too. The point is. There are strong patterns of authoritarianism in Latin America. And if we think that starts with the last few decades, think again. Here we've got two authoritarian systems portrayed by a, an artist of the early 1600s, an Inca descendant, who was trying to show how badly mistreated his people were by the Spanish. Well, the Spanish and the Inca were kind of in competition for mistreating people. 
They both believed in themselves very strongly. They both believed that they had the God-given right to conquer other people. The Inca were the son of the sun, sons of the sun, the children of the sun. The Inca emperor was divine in the, every sense of the term. Wasn't even a member of our species as far as the Inca were concerned. He was an authority, but an extreme authority, a polarized authority. In some ways, you need that, right? You have to set yourself very apart to be an authority. Otherwise, everyone's an authority. How did we get here? Now, the Spanish did their own thing and, of course, took down the Inca. But they were hardly, that couple of authoritarian societies, were hardly the beginnings of this. Before the Inca began, cranked up at 1430 AD, and only lasted 100 years, we had societies like the Moche here in National Geographic Vision. Um, dramatizing some things that actually happened. An individual seated on this dais who is capable of ordering and is about to order the death and bleeding of these two prisoners taken in warfare and their blood drained into the two goblets that the young people in the background are holding. And he may or may not drink the blood, our authority, but Things are set up to really highly differentiate those who are doing well here and those who aren't. Authority was already well underway by about 100 AD. It was really in place, we could say. And it has the trappings of militarism all over it. Coercion is involved. So is that how we started out? Did we get to authority through arms? Was it people pushing each other around, bonking each other in the head? Is that how we got here? I hope not. It's not a very comforting thought that the foundations of our society were based on military activity. At least I don't find it comforting. But we haven't gotten to the answer yet. So I want to ask, before societies like the Moche, where did the origins of authority begin? And how did it take form? Well, let's look at time. And here's how I look at it for the Andes. We've got this long formative period in which you go from basically minimalist agriculturalists, people living dispersed on a landscape, no towns to speak of, no real vestiges of authority. No evidence that people had more, could boss people around, any of the things that seemed to distinguish authoritarian society. By the time we hit zero, the formative's over, and we transit into the boring states. Why are they boring? I find the Inca boring. You could study the Inca, you could study the Romans, you could study a whole bunch of different states. They're all very similar because they all have to have this authoritarian character. They may adorn it with art, but for the most part, they get more similar over time. There's convergence from rather more diverse formative beginnings. So the formative is what I want to look at, and we're going to be particularly looking at the middle and late formative, 1300 BC to 500 BC, um, the time of Chavin. Now, just to get one thing clear, there's authority and there's power. Power is classically defined as the ability of one person or group of people to get another person or group of people to do something. It's just that simple. But authority is different because a lot of things can get a group of people to do something. It can be the threat of force. It can be charisma and personality. It can be law. You shall respect the person in this authoritarian or authority position. But the idea then is that there's something correct about this. Authority, unlike power, a much broader thing, authority is the more narrower type of power that is legitimate. It's believed in. People are accustomed to it. It's the type of things that make us ask, and I've done this, not so long ago, 
walk into a room, there's 30 people in there, and there's nobody up in front. You say, OK, who's in charge? Who's running this meeting? Who's the one that's going to be calling on people for questions? Who's et cetera? If we don't see an authority, if we don't, we have the idea that over a certain number of people, there will be somebody in charge. We grew up with that idea. It's deep within us. So deep that when we think about extraterrestrials, what's the first thing they say when they come to the world? <laughs> Take me to your leader. They as we assume that they assume that we would have a leader. And you know, if you think about it, you say, I can't get out of that box. Of course you have to have a leader. How could you coordinate people without having a person or a small group of people who are running the show? I don't know, but I don't think I can know. I don't have an access to that thought. I think there could be a lot of ways. They're outside of our way of thinking and maybe outside of our way of being, human limitations. But. Again, the question is, how did this come to be then? How do we go from a broad sense of power, based on many things, to a sense of power in which we simply believe that the role, the name, could be a president, it could be an emperor, it could be headman, chief, whatever you want. That person intrinsically has the right. And the office is bigger than the individual. How do we come to believe in this? Because 5,000 years ago, in most parts of the world, it didn't exist. Authority was not there. Early human beings were not these, you know, the old image of band of hunter-gatherers with a head man, head man, and it was always a head man, rarely a head woman. But, you know, that's wrong. Hunter-gatherers didn't live that way. People had limited authority over some parts of life. There could be experts in different activities, for instance, ritual experts. But they did not hold a broad pattern of authority over their societies. This is something of our last 5,000 years in most places. There may be a few places that go a few hundred years before that. That's a little bit more challenging. Where did it come from? Here's a graphic I put together before these colors had any meaning in our society. And therefore, I take no responsibility for any suggestions about the meanings of these colors. These are two broad stereotypic patterns, like all stereotypes, erroneous, about how you might come to power, but particularly authority. On the left-hand side is one that depends on the idea of an authority coming about because of their altruistic feelings, dedication, service to their society to provide leadership, and therefore benefit the society by their leadership. We've all been in situations where we've seen this happen. I would suggest probably we've been in few situations where we've seen, at a very high level, authorities come through a purely altruistic route, where they have nothing in it for them. They don't care about the income, the status, the right of way, or the transfer of that to their offspring, the improvement of the perspectives for, for their descendants. But on the other side, where I identify sort of rather crassly the motivation is greed, getting into a position of authority clearly does privilege you whether you like it or not, you are potentially on the receiving end of a system of inequality. You're usually the top of that system in some sense. So you're motivated not to serve a system to improve the lives of others, but very much to improve your own and those of people close to you. Now, similarly, finding someone who matches that in our world of authority is a bit of a strain. I mean, pure, pure self-motivation. Um, so it's pretty hard to accept either of these as the stimulus. 
I want to help all you, and therefore I'm going to create or help create authority. I want to help myself, and therefore I'm going to create this maybe somewhat fanta uh, fantas fantasy of authority. It's probably somewhere in the middle, right? A mixture. That's more like the leaders we know. They're somewhere between these two extremes. Well, at the beginnings, what was the mixture? Aren't we looking at our ancestry there? Aren't we saying, what are we? Where did we come from? Where are these systems that we trust? If in country we trust, where did that come from? What was the mix at the outset of North America, the USA, of greed and altruism? I would insist they're both there. But let's go back to before that. The United States was not a pristine state. It was based in many senses on ideas running around. What's legitimate authority? So we go back in time. And what do we know? Much less, much less, almost nothing. I rest my case. That's why we need Chavin and we need me, because I can point you in some of the directions that I think were the origins of authority. So let's get to some archaeology here. Gosh sakes, time's a wasting. Um, that's a pot from the Chavin period. It's, roughly speaking, I like to think of it as 3,000 years ago. And its characteristics really help inform us about this time period. Polished blackware, heavily sculpted. And you might look at it and say, that's glazed, because there's light reflecting off of just about every surface. It is not. It's low fire pottery, no fused glass on the surface. That's all stone polishing, going down into the smallest furrows and bumps that you see on that. Hundreds of hours went into polishing that, but I can argue that that pot, with its curious stirrup, spout, stirrup spout form, probably never held anything in its life. It's a symbol of a pot. Could be used. Almost undoubtedly wasn't. It's probably burial furniture, actually. It went into the tomb with somebody. But it yet involves a huge amount of work. It's an everyday object, a pot, that has taken on a new meaning. And the person who owns that, has it, possesses it, and can display it is set apart from the person who can't. And not everybody's going to be able to pull the labor to do that. So we're looking at a sort of new thing in society. Not only do we have things that are expensive to produce and attract the eye, but they also start to appear in the Andes, broadly dispersed in the important places, the first towns that are beginning, and in association with the first monumental architecture, the first really big buildings. If we take the art that's on that and look at a more elaborate version, here's kind of a stereotypic Chavin image. Central human figure. That thing in the middle has two legs, roughly speaking a waist, an upper torso, two arms descending from shoulders, and a head on top, admittedly looking straight up and rather neckless. But that's a human form. There's nothing else in Latin America that looks anything like that. But after we get away from the basic form, the staff it's holding across the front of its body which is some sort of an agnathic mouth, crossed fangs, teeth, the snake hair coming off the head of this thing, the mouth of this creature that is a combination of harpy eagle or condor beak, and again, a feline crocodilian mouth. And you can just go through there and find in this Baroque infilling of stuff, literally hundreds of fierce looking animals or their parts. What's doing that? Well, we get some clues as when the, we can tell you, I can tell you where this was found. 360 degrees wrapped around a column about 10 feet high of cut granite-like rock, perfect cylinder of rock. 
So you could only see, at best, about 40% of this image. Try limiting yourself to 40% and see what sense you can make of that. You can't. And it's lightly engraved to begin with. This is an art that has to have a message. You're going to go to that level of effort without some sort of thought behind it? I don't buy it. This is meaningful. But what did it mean? We can't know. That I would argue they couldn't know either. If you saw this for the first time, you needed a priest or somebody there to tell you what it means, to let you walk around it in guided fashion and say, you see this? You see that? You know this? Connected to this? That relates to the myth we have of this and our belief of that. This is not an open art. This is something akin to a secret society, something very important in societies that seem to be moving towards statehood, in which information and the control of knowledge about rather esoteric things, maybe myths of origin, it may be ideas that support a social structure, a whole series of things are not the privilege of everyone. Really, the beginnings, perhaps more than economic differences, of inequality. Chavin's got a lot of it, and we're looking at images from it. Chavin is not alone. Here is Peru. The red dots represent formative sites, middle formative and late formative sites of significant status betrayed by the amount of monumental architecture they have. So up and down the Andes, people are doing similar things. I will make a chauvinist argument about Chavin that it is a little bit more among equals. It seems that it's the source of more ideas than other places. But then again, I work there. So no, I can't be trusted. And notice I can't be trusted at all, because I'm going to try to show you imagery that can try to convince you of what I'm thinking. Is that anything like what might be happening in the origins of authority, where I might be trying to convince you that I am the right person to be more than others, to run the show? Well, let's not go too far into that one. Here's Chavin. Monumental structures, truncated pyramids, platforms, and sunken plazas, a little bit hidden by some of the eucalyptus here. Um, monumental in the sense that these buildings, the central one on the middle left there, is about the size of a football field. And it's built about 80 feet straight up into the air. You don't make that much of a mass without a concerted amount of labor. From the site and the details, which I don't have time to go into, the roughly 800 years this site lasted, we see consistent patterns of architectural development that suggest a lineage of people planning this site. First time we see this in Peru. There had been monumental structures before, but they're rather randomly placed, and there's no sign of a common style or architectural tradition. Now we see that. Somebody's running this, and it looks like they are a descendant group of people. One way or another, they're closely related to each other, and they maintain architectural coherency over that length of time. The site itself is located geographically in an important place. The river in the foreground, the very base of the image, running from left to right is a tributary of the Amazon, as almost all Andean rivers are. They all flow from all the way over on the west coast to the east coast. Very little drains off into the Pacific. So this is an important place being on one of those tributaries of the Amazon, but it's also where two rivers join together. One river is flowing almost directly at us out of the White Mountains, the Cordillera Blanca, the great center of alpinism, or I should say, go fast. 60% deglaciated in the last 20 years, 60%. We had to drive through snowfields to get to Chavin 25 years ago. They are nowhere to be seen anywhere near the road now. Changing very, very fast. But those white mountains have always been regarded as deities in the Andes, powerful things that can unleash 
avalanches of snow and ice on the towns like Chavin below, and this happened in 1945, um, killing large numbers of people. Natural authority, power, the ability to change people's lives may be a model for what humans might try to be doing themselves. But this is what Chavin looked like at its architectural greatest extension, probably about 700 BC. And you can see again the sunken plazas, the platforms, and the monumental buildings above. It's consistent. It grew in a long, difficult pattern of additions. We can find something like 51 major building events, and we think we're missing two-thirds of them at least. It's because we can't figure them out. So there's a long architectural history, but Chavin has some special features that we can't really see here that we definitely need to get into. One is the way Chavin was built. A core of material, you see in the upper left-hand part of this image, lines of stones, select but not worked stones, that are set in a formulaic clay mortar that when it hardens is like cement. We know. We've dug through it, and it's really, really difficult. We avoid, when possible, doing that. We originally called that a fill behind the major stone walls that you see over the rest of the image. Cut stone in the upper layers, and that's cut granite. These are blocks going one to five tons. And then select quartzite down at the bottom where it looks a little bit more scrappy, that it's not cut. But it's select and fractured enough to make it fit conformably. We always thought these were the strength of the site. You built the walls and you filled inside it. Turns out we were absolutely opposite wrong. The nuclear core is the strength of the site. And we think in every major earthquake that this area suffered, these facades fell off. So it's a very different way of approaching it. Gives this sense of solidity. And for 3,000 years old, that's not bad, especially when you consider this upper left-hand area is about, we think, 800 years exposed with no stone cover over it. And it's very, very stable. Impressive. But that solidity is betrayed because inside those structures, those truncated pyramids, there are a series of passageways, galleries, stone-lined tunnels, in effect, large enough to walk comfortably through, even for us, sometimes a little bit more expansive, that are put together in a labyrinthine fashion. Something like this. This represents less than half of the now 36 known gallery systems in Chavin. So they're pervasive through all of these structures. They go deeply underground. The one on the far right is 40 feet. Its ceiling is 40 feet below surface. It's a tricky thing to do in stone architecture. You're not going to put a wood roof in there, I'll guarantee you that. With the overburden? You've got to run stone beams that are going well above 10 tons to support the weight from above. And they were clearly designed to do just that. Yet the space you get is small, dark, dank, not really useful for much of anything that we would think of. You can't live there. There's very little light, really none, although I'll tell you when there is. You can't store anything there that's perishable because it will grow fungus very fast. It's a nice, damp, temperature-controlled environment. It's just ideal for biological growth. So what would they have invested all this energy in building this odd space for? Well, deep down in this gallery that sort of comes nearest us with the cross shape right at its end, the Lanzone Gallery has at the crossing there this built into it. 15 foot high monolith of granite carved with this same iconography of Chavin, same art pattern. This is what it looks like, 3D scanned, digitally reproduced from four different angles. We got the same fangs, snake hair, claws on the hands, etc. 
fierce individual, deep in there. No one has ever removed it or altered it since it was placed. Just think of how many times you've seen an original, what can really only be called an idol, in its original location 3,000 years later, especially after things like the Spanish destruction of idolatry. It, we have no idea why they didn't take this out. They actually knew about it. So this begins to tell us something about the site and the galleries. First off, these buildings are not fortresses, palaces, residences, marketplaces, or anything else of the type. Neither their form nor their excavated contents suggest any of those things. The system of temples. This is a religious operation of some sort. And here is one of its primary images. So maybe these galleries tended to be used in ritual. That's an interesting thing. Fix that thought. The art, like we see in the Lanzon figure, is found in many places in this site, or I should say it originally was. Here we have a tenon head, a head that has a peg on the back so it can be stuck into the wall. And you can see the sockets for more running down the line that argue that there were heads decorating the very upper edge of the stone walls. Generally above the ground, these stone heads would have been at least 40 feet towering above you, and in some cases considerably more. The stone heads themselves have striking characteristics. We can go through a sequence starting with the more human-like of the heads. Keep in mind, Andean hair is straight. This creature doesn't have straight hair. Its eyebrows are clearly showing rudimentary animal faces of some sort. But the rough sense of humanity is there. But as we start going from these most human ones through to less human ones, we see a number of characteristics emerge. One is staring eyes. These eyes, actually, the pupils are deviated from center. So they're actually seeing beyond infinity, you might say. They're staring out into unimaginable space. Something is coming off the face. You might take it for a mustache, but it's not. It's emerging out of the nose. Some sort of a flow in the, is coming out there. A figure eight mouth, deeply furrowed cheeks around the, the sides. It's, it's still human, but moving away. If we go along the line, we start to see that a fang appears in the mouth. Now the mouth is fully wrapped around an emerging snout. Eventually, that mucal flow, as I would argue it is, from the nose converts into a second fang. And this is definitely not your next door neighbor. And we end about here, which is a fantasy creature we can't identify in the Andes at all, a dragon of some sort. We have every step between. There are about 110 known heads at this point. We find one about every two years, a new one. So what does this seem like? Well, it's suggestive of shamanism. Shamanism is something we have an image of in our society that is really not close to what it generally means. Shamanism is not a way to find yourself, neither the shaman nor the shaman's patrons. Shaman are problem solvers, and they're very precarious because they claim to have access to other worlds, secret information. They're like the beginnings of secret societies. They say, you got a problem, lingering, nagging health problem won't go away, all right, I'll take it on. But I'm going to have to go somewhere else to find the answer. And I'm going to have to go into another entity. I'm going to transform into something else. Quite often, psychoactive drugs are used in this process by both the shaman and the patient. But remember, the patient may be having health problems, or it may be a group of people having societal problems, conflicts in society. It may be problems with the local environment. Shaman comes back with information, tries to apply it, and if it works, or he can convince people it works, 
the shaman's ahead. What happens if it doesn't work? Oh, so you've got the power to solve this problem and you haven't solved it? Could it be that you have no intention and you're the one that caused it in the first place? Black magic. Okay. Precarious. Very definitely precarious. And we've never seen shaman have temples, massive temples, like at Chavin. Yet, it keeps coming back to this idea of transitions, secret information, and such. So I have little doubt that shamanism was not involved in the origins of Chavin, but this has evolved. And the fact that we get a fair amount of imagery, like this, where we see these transformed individuals with the crossed fangs, the snake hair, in this case, an individual carrying a columnar object, which we are quite sure is San Pedro cactus, close relative of mescaline. Maybe there's a new message here. We're permanent. You may not see the crossed fangs, but we are transformed for life. We have permanent communication with that other side. We have communication with, to put it most simply, the gods. Or maybe we were born to the gods, or maybe we're going to be gods when we die. There's a lot of different versions one can imagine. But nonetheless, here we've got something going that looks like it's creating a belief that isn't seen, or maybe it is. Maybe there are ways of making it seen. Maybe there are ways of convincing people. Now, before we leave the tenant heads, I just want to give you this image. People living today on the east side of the Andes and especially down into the Amazon still use a lot of the psychoactive drugs that we argue for use in Chavin. This individual is about to receive a load of snuff blown through, probably a blow tube, you know, actually used in hunting, and that snuff is going to go into his sinuses. This is not pleasant. Try it sometime. Take a, you know, a big straw for chai tea or whatever it is, load it with flour, and have somebody blow it into your sinus and see how you feel about it. You will have an involuntary reaction which will make your cheeks furrow and pull back. And your mouth is going to pull back from that unhappiness in your sinuses. And even with flour, I bet, you're going to start throwing mucus out in large quantities. Uh, nice correspondence with our tenon heads. Uh, it seems very likely that we have evidence, and most archaeologists, all archaeologists that I'm aware of, accept the idea that tenon heads um, represent drug use and the paraphernalia we find at Chavin. Blow tubes, little mortars, tiny mortars appropriate for grinding sinus quantities of uh, drugs. We think we've got that one tacked down. But let's look at a few more characteristics of this site really quickly. In the galleries, we frequently have what you see here is a black square, a ventilator. I call them ducts now, and you'll see why. These are tubes, really channels, somewhat like our ducting system you'd see if the panels weren't on the ceiling, that interconnect spaces. Frequently, they connect to the outer world from an internal gallery or between internal galleries. They do both. They're always straight as arrows, and multiple segments of them are straight aligned. Creates a little bit of a problem. What were these really for? Probably multiple things. But here's a gallery, a model we've made of a gallery, taken the roof off, and I've extended sort of dowel-like features in uh, white and blue running through these ducts and pointing in the direction that that duct would force an orientation some of them between galleries and some to the outside world. They're so frequent that simple ventilation seems to be an overkill. We're well overkilled in this situation. And we puzzled over this in the background of our minds until one day when we were mapping one of these galleries with a Stanford team, one of the Stanford students said, when the electric light system, precarious always, went out. Would it help if I went outside with a pocket mirror 
and bounce sunlight into the gallery. And I went, oh yeah, now we're getting somewhere because we have little pocket mirror sized coal mirrors high at grade anthracite, which aren't great at imagery, but they're about 60% light efficient. Very common artifact at Chavin. So the student went outside with a pocket mirror and lit up the gallery. Now the student had to stand there and constantly adjust for the movement of the sun. But all of a sudden, the lack of soot in the roofs and the ceilings and everything, it all starts to come together now. It's making sense. And so maybe they were bringing light in through these ducts. And I went, another revelation. Oh yeah, there's a duct that aims right at the face of the lens zone. So we run over there, put the pocket mirror outside, and the raking light coming across the engravings on that stone monolith bring out the imagery in no uncertain terms. So it looks like 3,000 years ago when people didn't go underground, believe me, people were being taken underground and then a light show was being put on. To add another element, here is the excavation of a gallery back in 2001. It's the tiniest gallery. It's the little gallery that could. A lot of background to it. We didn't quite know what to expect in this gallery, but within about a week and a half, we got our first strombus trumpet. This is a conch, major conch shell that's had the spire lopped off of it to make it into a musical instrument, if you will. Over time, and that was the time of the inauguration of Alejandro Toledo as president to the sound of Strombus trumpets, somewhat reflecting the pattern of village authorities in the south of Peru, the Varayok, the staff carriers, who always have a trumpet player announce their presence, Strombus trumpet. So it plugged into a whole system of background. Here's a group of these trumpets lying on the floor of the gallery. We found 20. We found impressions in the floor and fragments of broken up trumpets, enough to suggest a minimum of 50 trumpets in this 15, no, it's 20 by four foot space. Many of them beautifully engraved. Well, here's what one of these does. This is the same species, Galeatus, um, but it's modern, modified in the same way. To give you an idea what one sounds like in a space this big, you can guess what it would sound like in a smaller gallery. <laughs> So maybe noise was on their side too, <laughs> playing around with light, sound, space in these underground galleries, the mind through the drugs. We're getting somewhere. We're, this is like a convincing system. And let me show you where that goes. I came back with the news of these 20 trumpets that got into the Stanford Magazine. Next thing I know, I'm getting a call from John Chowning. John Chowning, as you may know, is the inventor of electronic music. He was here at Stanford in Karma, Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. And he's giving me a call and saying, John, would you like to have an acoustic analysis of Chavin? And I'm going, whoa, take me there. And he said, well, we got this starting graduate student, Miriam Kohler, She's got tremendous background in the use of sound. She's been setting up concerts and special effects in concerts. She really knows what she's doing, and we're giving her the computational skills to understand the acoustic settings in a variety of places. And I said, bring her on. So here she is taking notes on her countryman speaker, this tiny speaker with incredible fidelity, that is blasting out Strombus trumpet sound to this dandelion microphone with its distri distribution of 
microphones in space, it can characterize the reverberance of the galleries. And there's a lot of things she found out, but let me really highlight one. Here we're looking down on the Lanzone Gallery. That's the Lanzone is that little diamond right at the middle top in the cross part of the gallery. As you come down that major shaft leading down to the Lanzone, it terminates in that duct, which I said, casts light on the face of the Lanzone when sunlight's reflected with a pocket mirror. That duct, if you can see, tapers in a very distinctive tapering form, not common to most ducts. Miriam was suspicious. She said, tapering ducts are generally filters for sound frequencies. So theoretically, she calculated it up and said, that duct will filter out all frequencies except those right around the native voice of the trumpet, the strombus trumpet. And then she tested it. That's when I came into the picture. I knew nothing about what she was doing. I walked into the circular plaza one day, and there's Miriam with some measuring equipment. She says, I'm measuring the sound of Strombus trumpet being played down in the gallery. And uh, I said, well, can you play it? She said, well, and I said, I interrupt her. I said, well, let's wait until the truck's going by on the road across the river. She says, there's no truck over there. You're hearing the Strombus trumpet being played in the gallery. That would be the equivalent, roughly speaking, of me playing the strombus trumpet in the middle of the quad and us hearing it in here. Inexplicable. You would say, what are we hearing? And somebody says, it's coming from the quad. You say, no, that would take the biggest air horn ever imaginable. Not possible. It was possible and it is possible. We've got a way in which Things going on in the Lanzone chamber, which might handle five people at the most, could be heard in a much larger space where a group of people would not understand what's being said. Only the priests know that, of course. Can you understand Stromba's trumpet? I can't. Um, but they know it's happening. There's credibility being added to something going on deep underground that you may not be privileged to be present for. The priests want you to believe in. If that's not enough, the Lanzone's mouth is aimed at the duct, which is this filter. So a duct undoubtedly brings air in. It probably brought light in, and it probably brought sound out to a group of potential converts, questioning whether Chavin was everything it's cracked up to be. Would it be worth me, imagine I'm a person from some other part of Peru in the Andes, and I'm saying, God, I want to be more of an authority, but I don't have the credibilities for it. You know, my little namby-pamby shamanism is accepted, but people aren't saying, oh, you're most eminent. You're really important. You should be the one making the decisions around here. Um, I need symbols, like maybe pottery, really elaborate, high investment pottery. I need a group of icons and imageries which only I understand, and I can explain to some people. And that's why I'm going to go to Chavin, because I've heard that the priests, for a price, will explain how they do their rituals. First, you're probably just going to go through the rituals and get convinced that Chavin has really got something going. How could you go into underground spaces, be confronted with light? There's no light at that time except occasional campfires or something. But the controlled light, the priest says, and now behold the Lanzone. You've been in the gallery for two hours. Your eyes are totally dilated. And bam, the shaft of light comes in, lights up the Lanzone. The drugs that you've got forcing you to mucus like crazy are taking effect. You're out of your place, you're in their place, and they're telling you what makes the world work. And it isn't what you've ever believed before, but now you're being impacted with information that's really telling you exactly what's going on from the priest's point of view. You're starting into a secret society you're going to start rising up the ranks. 
you're going to gain the symbols and the knowledge to take this back to your community and try to do something similar and get an authority pattern starting there. It's credible. It's based on credibility. It's not based on force. And so Chavin goes. Chavin is, to my mind, a convincing system. It's based on a series of phenomena which have no explanation, no reasonable explanation other than that the people in charge of Chavin are in contact with greater powers and they can bring greater powers in at their command. They have a world that when you experience it, you could reject it, but you may have ulterior motives for not and you may have been very effectively convinced at the outcome that what you saw was real and impactful. Okay. So Chavin, along with the other big monuments of this time period, is depending on this sort of credibility, finding ways to build it, using creativity to change people's minds about how social structure should be and naturally is. Natural now has to include this supernaturally driven aspect of human life. And that works for probably nearly 800 years. And when it comes crashing down, it comes crashing down for a very clear reason. Coercively based societies. Chavin has very little evidence of arms very little evidence of conquest, very little evidence of people being sacrificed, for instance. There are human bones scattered around Chavin, but there's not a single image that I b believe is original um, that shows Chavin taking a life. But after Chavin ends, that all changes. That's when the moche come in. That I showed you the guy sitting and waiting to receive the blood of the sacrificed military captives. Chavin has no defense against that. There are no fortifications at Chavin. The number of arms they had is probably small, and there's no sign that they had any idea really what to do with them in an organized way. The systems become coercive, but that's not where they start. They start in credibilities, the ability to get people to believe in something to make a model of a different world and then show them the evidence that that other world exists. Humans, the model builders. We are model builders and model believers. And I don't need to go anywhere today to talk about how different our models can be. It's an incredible capability that humans have and an incredible debility. We can believe in things that aren't there and believe in them passionately. That's part of why we're here today. We are those evolved humans who have this capability, well adapted to state societies, but it's not completely under control, is it? Um, so many different ways of looking at things in the world, and Chavin expertly was anticipating precisely those, using originality to rebuild society based on what is a religion, and religion is radical. At that point, religion is used to restructure society when usually religion is used to maintain the structure of society, keep things in place. A fascinating time period. That is the formative. And Chavin, I think, is one of the best representatives of that time period. And that's where I think we came from. Patterns of credibility established by human ingenuity, innovation, creativity. It's a glorious story, but for the future, we're probably going to have to get a hold on things somehow. Get these models under control. I have no idea. That's for the next generation. It's important that we recognize models when we see them. We all have them. Some of them lead us in good directions, some not so good. It's not for me to say what those are. At any rate, I think the past can tell us a lot about who we are. And 
hopefully I've convinced a few of you. Thank you so much.